Hey, what's going on, everyone? Ryan Leary here from Work Defined. You know, if there was one thing that I could change about recruiting, it would probably be the amazingly awful candidate experience that job seekers have to endure at one of the most stressful times in their life. Hiring teams, it is time to step up. You've got to create an experience that is memorable, fast, and efficient. And you can do that with Indeed Smart Sourcing. Check them out online at Indeed.com or just Google Indeed Smart Sourcing. Deal has helped over 35,000 businesses simplify global hiring, onboarding, payroll, and compliance. Visit Deal.com to learn more. That's D-E-E-L.com. And this is William Tincup and Ryan Leary, and you are listening, hopefully watching, the You Should Know podcast. Today we have VJ on, and we'll be talking about his latest book, The Alchemy of Talent. And uh, we know uh, VJ because we serve on an advisory board together. We do. And in talking with him, he was telling us about his new book. We're like, uh, yeah, we got to do this bit, man. We got to know more about this book. So uh, let's just start. VJ. First of all, Ryan, how are you doing? I got to do this bit because if I don't, he, he gets he gets butt hurt. So how, how are you? <laughs> well, you can't just say that and move on, VJ. Sometimes he'll just go through the intro and just say, "This is William Tinka, VJ. Nice to meet you." Like I'm right here, erased, <laughs> just I'm erased. I'm right here. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm doing well. I'm a, I'm feeling a little. Um, what should I say? Um, not able. to... I don't know the right term here, but I'm looking at VJ's You're beard. You're having a hard time putting questions together? I, 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 I'm looking at VJ's beard, and I'm looking at the scruff that I now have left. Oh, yeah. That's a legit beard thinking, right there. How in God's name do I do that? Like, no, that's a legit beard. That's yeah. that's a that's a beard. That's a mm-hmm. full beard. Even, that's a even real VJ, beard. even at full growth, which was just yesterday, yeah. it's still like high school patchy everywhere. And I said, let me trim it up, you know. I, I trimmed it down. All so my, now I'm just a cue ball. My beard uh, is, it's, the hairs just get longer. Mm-hmm. There's, they don't get filled in. It just, they exactly. just get, it just gets uglier. So, it is what it is. I will say now that we've decided to open the show about beards. 100%. 100%. <laughs> the trade off here is you too can have a thick, full, dark, beautiful beard if you're okay. willing to take the trade off of, South Indian genetics, so that when I was graduating <laughs> from high school, I was maybe 120 pounds dripping wet, and I was six foot one. So, you, you know, South Indian dudes can have some rock and facial hair, but but I I mean, you know, I was like a piece of paper. Yeah, <laughs> when I was yeah, yeah. You had a full beard. If, but you if had the wind, beard, if the wind you blew, you, you blew over. Yeah. What part so, of what part yeah. of the Southern India? Where did you grow up? So I grew up in Chicago. My family is uh, comes from the Bangalore area, and yeah, I, yeah, I know yeah. we've got several tech backgrounds in the room. So, you know, the um, my parents are both from small like small towns, but right. now because of urbanization and where jobs are and everything, many of my cousins live and work in the tech sector. And- wow, I, I've it. been there twice. It's uh, it's fantastic. So, uh, where in Chicago did you grow up? All the way at the northern edge of the city, right where the Evanston Chicago border is. If you've yeah. taken the red line all the way north to Howard, yeah, uh, like five blocks off of that red line. Okay, so. uh, I know where you're at. All right, do us a favor and introduce yourself, and then we'll jump into the book. All right, Vijay Pendakur. I'm happy to spend time with you today, William and Ryan. I see Ryan. Look, I'm naming you. I'm calling you in. I'm like William, who's as long as over. Somebody loves me. I'm good. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> God new author. Uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, I think today we're talking about the author side of things. So I'll bring yeah. up some other bio points here. Um, I was uh, in education for a very long time. I worked at five universities um, around the country. So those jobs had me moving from the Midwest to the West Coast to the East Coast and um, uh, worked on the relationship between environments and student success. So how do learning environments shape the trajectory? of students um, and with particular attention to what geeks call non-cognitive performance factors. We can get dig into that if you Mm -hmm. want. Um, 
And then I moved into employee experience work um, in corporations and tech companies. I worked at Zynga, which is a video game company, and then VMware, and then Dropbox. And then um, after that, launched a fractional advisory business. And my first client was Salesforce. And now I'm just doing all kinds of things. And I get to be on, you know, as a uh, work as an advisor alongside the two of you at a phenomenal organization, WISC. And I have a new book out. Man, I'm, there's a lot to unpack there. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> let's let's start with the book because we could go into your background and just talk about your background forever. Uh, the the alchemy of talent. Out of all the ideas that you you had, I'm just assuming there's a post-it note involved, lots of post-it notes. What what got you to focus on this? There were there were a number of post-it notes. Um, yeah. and um, I think there was a a mix of optimism and skepticism, skepticism that drove me to writing this book. And so let me, right. let me try and answer it with a balance of Not optimism right. and skepticism. The yin so, and yang. All right, yes. I got it. So um, the harsh reality that drove this was I was the um, VP for diversity, equity, and inclusion, or the chief diversity officer at multiple um, large, complex organizations, publicly held companies. Right. And I lived through the rise, the meteoric rise, and the, you know, Icarus-style <laughs> contraction in the DEI space. Right. And part of what I learned in trying to lead a function through explosion and contraction was um, a lot of lessons the hard way. And I think almost all real learning happens in the, in, in the operational battlefield and fog of war. And... Um, Part of what I figured out was in the search for stable ground in a function that was constantly being told to appear in different ways and then misappearing. And the difference between idea and execution was tremendous. The distance from best practice was tremendous. And where I found stable ground was around shifting from the normative language of DEI into the behavioral science of, of high-performing teams. Oh, um, yeah. Cool. And over and over again, I was able to make connections with product and go-to-market leaders around, hey, tell me what's going on. Let me do some journey mapping and design thinking around what's happening for your teams. And they would go, I just, I need resilience. I need resilience for my team because we're living in a state of constant disruption. Or um, I've rapidly diversified my org because we've moved into 12 new geographic markets in the last 18 months. And I cannot establish any sort of central sense of belonging for my people now because there's a level of complexity that my people leaders don't know how to handle. Or we did a, a riff and the people who are left don't trust us anymore, even though they're still here. And I'm so surprised by this. And I'm like, well, let's talk about the behavioral science of trust. Um, mm -hmm. And in all of those things, I was deeply consultative and advising and strategizing and building with the business. And so when I was launching on my own and trying to think of a piece of thought leadership that I could bring to market, that could help cut through the signal and noise issues facing DEI. The skepticism here is like, look, what would make sense if you look me up on LinkedIn, you're going to see multiple decades of work tied to diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm not writing a DEI book right now, but I can right. still take everything I know and deploy it in the high-performing teams arena tied to the behavioral science of how we unlock flourishing for people at work. Um, and for me, I actually see that as a DEI book. I'm just not using that language. Um, and I promised the optimistic take here. The optimism here was that um, in the last 18 months, I've, I'm pretty heavily tech facing, although I do work in manufacturing and energy and transportation, but a lot of my clients are Silicon Valley based companies. And um, there's been this real increased attention to performance. If you talk to any tech CHRO right now and you say, give me your top three things keeping you up at night, one of them is, well, we're doing, we're raising the bar on performance. And then if you dig in and if you're lucky enough to have a, a martini or a cup of coffee in front of you and you can have a real conversation with that person and get into the details and you, and you go, what, what does it mean for you to focus on performance? Largely what you're going to hear is uh, what I call talent hygiene or performance hygiene, which means Okay, so what we're doing is we're doing some rigorous attention to nine box. That's HR language of mm -hmm. trying to plot where our talent sits against certain kinds of uh, performance and capability metrics. We're doing, uh, we're reskilling managers on talent evaluation. So how do you do your annual performance review? 
And we've got some gating metrics set up so that only 5% of the organization can get exceeds and 10% of the organization has to get a one or a two, you know, a needs improvement or a, that's, you that's got the go. IBM way. Yeah, exactly. There's an, and now we're doing some talent density mapping and uh, we've got a hypo program, a high potential program. I don't want to use too much HR language here, but you know, this is the basic playbook when they say we're focusing on performance. And so I go, okay, great. You're focusing on performance. I see that you've had three riffs in the last 18 months. What are you doing on trust? <laughs> oh, we're not, we're not doing anything on trust. I see that you, um, you're, you know, when, when we've been talking, you've talked about how uh, your intent to leave score is actually pretty high. So it seems like you actually have a crisis of belonging or resilience on your team. Hi, I'm Stephen Rothberg. And I'm Jeanette Leeds. And together, we're the co-hosts of the High Volume Hiring Podcast. Are you involved in hiring dozens or even hundreds of employees a year? If so, you know that the typical sourcing tools, tactics, and strategies, they just don't scale. Yeah. Our bi-weekly podcast features news, tips, case studies, and interviews with the world's leading experts about the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to high-volume hiring. Make sure to subscribe today. What are you doing to reskill managers to lead for, for belonging or resilience? Or what's your connection strategy now that you're 80% hybrid and 15% remote and 5% in office? Uh, oh, we don't have a connection playbook. And so for me, the optimistic side here was I can bring forward a level of um, research and data and science around performance that is part of this performance conversation that somehow is the blind spot for the, the valley, Silicon Valley right now. If you want performance and you don't pay attention to non-cognitive performance factors, to take it all the way back to the start of this conversation, right? The reality that humans sit in an environmental ecosystem and the environmentals actually have a um, can be tailwinds or headwinds, then you're missing out on half of the levers that you could be pulling to increase performance. We know that high-performing teams also function off of a currency of trust, belonging, and connection. But we're not adding that into the performance playbook. It's all talent density, gating metrics, hypo, you know, let's exit out folks, IDPs, yada, yada, yada. Why, why do you find companies are ignoring this or failing to bring this to the forefront? Um, yeah, that, that's a great question. I think that there, I, I generally find that the executive layer of the companies I work with are super smart, super ambitious people. So this is not, I, there's, I don't want to gaslight here and be like, oh, you know, people are just dumb. They don't get it. That's not, <laughs> that's not true. I think a number of things have happened here um, that are resulting in a, mis a potential missed opportunity. Um, and le so let's, let me confine my comments to tech specifically, and then maybe we can think beyond mm -hmm. that. But there, there was a good decade of, um, of endless wealth and prosperity in tech from, let's say, 20, 2012 to 2022, right? And part of the amount of VC money and private equity money and Wall Street deciding to not enforce kind of core, <laughs> you know, uh, mechanics like the rule of 40 for SaaS companies, and, you know, like there was just a lot of, of, uh, of um, internal governance uh, pieces that were, weren't in place. And so um, the executive layer could count on unbelievable um, levels of OPEX spend to sort of drive things like culture and um, employee total rewards and it, and you know uh, the val the employee value proposition became like look we're just going to pay top of market right. uh, you know even if we're not actually that successful as a company there's a lot of really bizarre sort of counter capitalist things happening in the valley for a decade and then all of a sudden I mean like all of a sudden you know, things changed, right? 2022, yeah. about halfway into 2022, Wall Street pulled Silicon Valley's card in a hard way, right? And you have a whole layer in the executive group that doesn't remember any other difference. The last time normal market fundamentals were applied, they were mid-level. I was at companies or advising in companies where the entire VP plus group, the median age was late 30s. So you were in your late 20s the last time you were held yeah. accountable. So- this is, an, a, a, this is actually a bridge of empathy that I use to remind myself that people are like in shock right now around like, oh my gosh, we've got to hold folks accountable. We have to be performance-based. And the first thing you go to is the stick, right? In between carrots and sticks. When I say the stick, right. you right. go to the stick. 
right? And your your C-suite and your exec team is under immense pressure from their board. The board's gotten fiduciary all of a sudden, you know? <laughs> and you're like, oh, so then you go to the stick first and you're like, look, everybody needs to be on an IDP. And if, you know, we're going to, we, we've been tolerating underperformance. So the CHRO is, is suddenly, you know, like being whiplashed, right? To like, you know, make a right turn. And so I, I do think the, the, the knee jerk instinct was to go to performance hygiene, but, and, and the missed opportunity here is that we, sticks are important. We need accountability, right? And, and we should have, managers should know how to do annual performance reviews. Some of this is long overdue, particularly right. in tech. On right. the flip side though, we need to understand that humans, homo sapiens, our, our, act, our software has evolved over tens of thousands of years to also respond to environmentals that we can take advantage of here and, and amplify performance if we just had a broader playbook. And so that's, that's the optimist read here. And I, and I do think history sides with optimism um, is that we, we need to be able to expand the dashboard to add in next to the sticks some volume knobs on, on things like you know, trust and belonging and connection, which I know sometimes, particularly to an engineering leader, could come off as soft. But if you actually help them see the science, and a lot of what I do as a consultant and a speaker is talk about the behavioral science, the neuroscience, the data we have that actually proves out the business case for these things, people are like, oh, that makes sense. And so partially, I think that you know, we're, we're in a, um, a paradigm shift, Ryan. And um, when people let go of one trapeze bar, in, they actually don't immediately grab onto the next trapeze bar. There's a moment where you're in free fall. And we're in that moment right now in the town. You know, Ryan and I, on one of our, our new show, we cover a lot of things that have been happening in DEI and uh, programs being shuttered and all that type of stuff. And uh, it's fascinating to me because I think what I, well, what I like about your book and the, uh, the uh, approach is to make it a business decision for talent. Like, okay, we can talk about race. We can talk about gender. We can talk about all of those things, not opposed to having discussions about any of that stuff. However, why don't we just talk about how do we create high performing teams? There isn't yeah. a leader of any company of substance that would say, no, 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 no. <laughs> I don't want to talk okay, about I don't that. Want that. Right. Right. Exactly. I don't want that. Exactly. It's kind of every one of them is going to want that. And they're going to want to understand, okay, here's how we construct. Here's how we go about creating high performing teams. And oh, by the way, a derivative of that is DEI. Is inclusion, know. right? Inclusion inclu- is, is a catalyst, right? For human right. performance. Yeah. Right. Yes. But the but the what I what I like is you've created an argument that there is no counter argument to for business leaders. Yeah. Like if you came at them with belonging by itself, I think you get half of the audience. Yes. Right? Yes. Half the audience would go, mm, yeah, I don't really care if they belong. Yeah. I just care that they get their job done. Yep. Right? Yep. And same thing with, with all of the inclusion, equity, equality, diversity, all that stuff. That they're not defensible positions to the executive and the board level where hey, is, it a, is, it, is it good? Is it smart? Is it the right thing to do? Yeah, the moral part of this, no one disagrees with. But you're making a business case for high-performing teams. Some of that will trickle down into all of those areas. Yes, yes. Have Ryan William, did you uh, catch on to Nassim Taleb's work on anti-fragility in the economic ah, space? No, I have not. So you know, Nassim Taleb, famous for Black Swan events, right? Um, yeah. A number of years after the Black Swan moment, um, brought forward this idea of anti-fragile um, things. So huh. quick, uh, you know, quick review for the listener. You might find this novel, right? I did when I heard it. So you have, you have three categories of things, and we often only define the first two and we leave the third one undefined. You have fragile things. Fragile things are things that break under shock or friction. Um, there's plenty of examples in the product design space. There's plenty of examples in the thought space. Uh, your friend that comes through with the clickbaity hot take in a debate, and you're like, wait, but what about, and then the whole thing falls apart. Fragile idea, right? Um, <laughs> on the opposite side, you actually have robust or durable things. Robust or durable things are things that withstand shock or friction. And these are well understood. Uh, Nassim Taleb uses the example of a wine glass versus a plastic cup. If you drop the wine glass, it breaks. If you drop the plastic cup, it withstands the shock. 
what about things that actually get better when exposed to shock or friction? So this is actually the this is actually the first chapter of my book. First chapter of my book is not about trust, belonging, or connection. Right. It's the, it's the concept of anti fragility and the relationship to high performance teams. And so here's here's the through line because I think you're you're pretty analytical listener based, right? Um, the best vi- this most solid ground for business leaders is uh, on high performing teams that I felt I could contribute to. Right. Is um, team chemistry that unlocks innovation potential. Uh, when I'm because I'm so heavily valley facing in these tech companies, team leaders and my conversation with many many team leaders across multiple parts of Valley, I need my team to be more focused on great. Let's look at the science of innovation. And one of the things you see on teams that consistently outperform in innovation, and there's 20 years of research to support this, is that friction is a key driver of innovation. Conflict. Friction upends yeah. conformity and enhances yeah. deliberation. I'm using a line from a piece of research that came out in 2014. Up and which, conformity and enhanced deliberation. Which, ironically, is diversity. Boom. That's it. So, th- so that you, you, that's the whole thing right there. Is yeah. So, what I do when I'm work, when I give a keynote, I have a keynote um, that you know I do at conferences, and this, this is a key driver for how I end up engaging with businesses. Oh my goodness! Bad touching, harassment, sex, violence, fraud, threats—all things that could have been avoided if you had fama stop hiring dangerous people fama.io ready to launch a career and future you can be proud of welcome to merrill where an industry leading advisor training program will help you get licensed and with lead gen support from bank of america's vast customer base you'll get the referrals you need to establish your own practice it's time to see your career charge forward with merrill Apply now at careers.bankofamerica.com. Copyright 2024, Bank of America Corporation. And the keynote opens with the, this, I tell the story of the research on friction and, ide- and ideation and innovation. And everybody in the audience is like nodding, right? And then uh, I talk about friction in our own lives, right? And the times that I've been in an echo chamber when my board of advisors, my personal board of advisors is too similar to me. And those right. are the times I have epically bombed in my life. <laughs> And, and the times that I've been lucky mm. enough to have people who call me or who are willing to stop and go, dude, I think you're making a huge mistake, either with a tactic or a life choice, or don't propose to her. She's bad for you. <laughs> you know, all the things. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the friction is if you are ready for it, can unlock anti-fragility where it actually improves your process. It's, it is a catalyst for transformation. And the great setup here is that there's, fabulous research that shows that it is not diversity alone that gets you there because actually average management of diverse teams underperforms against homogenous teams. Homogenous right. teams are easier to manage. That's right. Um, if you buy into diversity as an on-ramp to friction and friction as a catalyst for anti-fragile outcomes, you actually need the, the leader to have the catalyst to tap into the power of that diversity. And I position trust, belonging, and connection as the catalyst for the alchemy of talent, that it allows you to take diversity as a as a form of friction, right. and actually turn it into a consistent outperformance. So the whole thing is, you could talk about this through DEI. There isn't really a reason to. You could just talk about this as the science of high performing teams. Um, and luckily, the research is on my side. <laughs> Truth. Can we can we build high performing teams before we have high performing leaders? <gasps> Snap, Ryan! It's Wednesday. Yeah, just I don't know if I can be smart enough to answer these questions on a Wednesday, <laughs> um, dude. That was awesome. Yeah. So, All right, there you go. So let's. Uh, I'm going to think out loud, right? It's a, uh, it's a, it's it's a chick. Yeah. It's a chicken and egg discussion. Nobody's so, listening. We're not recording. Think out. Yeah, right. <laughs> which one comes? Which one comes this is first? Space. This is safe yeah, space. Yeah, yeah. So I think what we, what, safe we space. what we often do in organizational dynamics is we define high performance for a leader as being an unbelievable individual contributor, and right. we reward them mm-hmm. by giving them three to five people to manage. Right. So, <laughs> which they may or may not be suited to manage. Exactly. High performance yeah. leadership is so different than high performance. Correct. When measured on the nine box, right? Like mm. this is this is the mismatch here, right? Like yeah. there is a leadership tool toolkit that is measurable, that is defined, that has business right. ROI, that is different than 
operational and productivity tasks, right? Like, right. And, and everybody has different strengths and weaknesses here. I remember when I got my first promotion in my 20s to managing a team. Um, and I had like, it was on a lark. There was a sudden change in the org and there was a sudden leader departure. And the leader who was leaving asked me if I could step in as an interim director. Um, real talk in retrospect, amazing opportunity for me, but like it shouldn't have happened. I had no idea what I was doing. Was this person took I... a huge leap of faith on me. Yeah. And the thing that came out of that moment is I actually came to learn I'm way better at leading a team than I am as an IC. My productivity oh, really? went up at work. My um, self-efficacy, my belief in my ability to do the job went up. Interesting. I, I stopped operating out of my drudgery zone and I was actually in my genius zone far more often. So for me, leading a team put me in my strengths 80% of the time. Oh, we're but that's not always the case. Complete opposites. Work, right. That's not <laughs> always the case, right? And so in, especially in corporate settings, we tend to reward um, right. unbelievable Ferrari level ICs, right? Like people that just right. turn around and it's like, right. hey, your reward is we're going to saddle you with a team. And, and you know, Google yeah. really figured out after a while, we have to create a promotion track for engineers that doesn't involve them managing people. And that this yeah. is how you get the, the mm-hmm. unlock of the principal engineer status, right? Yeah. Um, because some of these folks, you do not want managing people. And I say <laughs> that from a place of love. <laughs> like, um, and, and you're really hurting your own business. You know, um, was was Einstein a good people manager? Probably not. Probably not. Um, no. So, nope. Yeah. So, uh, nope, Ryan, yeah. is, is, that, is that a good answer to yeah, your question? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think so. And I think of we've had these discussions before where I, I'm thinking of an example of a, a sales leader, mm-hmm. somebody who is just crushing great, quota, right? Great IC. Yeah, Got it. fantastic at sales. Now they become head of sales, head of revenue, and it's like, whoop, forget it. They, they just don't have the ability to do that. How do we so, test? How do we test that? How do we know? I mean, again, scientifically, right? How do we know if they can make that transition? Was that where you were going, Ryan? Yeah, I want. Yeah, I want to know. Like, how do we? How do we know they can make the transition? Yep. And can a? Hey, it's Bob Pulver, host of podcast, human centric AI, AI driven transformation, hiring for skills and potential, dynamic workforce ecosystems, responsible innovation. These are some of the themes my expert guests and I chat about, and we certainly geek out on the details. Nothing too technical. I hope you check it out. A low performer in a group, obviously they can be a great manager, but mm-hmm. how does an organization pick out the, you know, we were talking earlier about the, you know, you're going to be the five. We had, we need, we need yeah, 20% we need of one. you to be at a one. Yeah. How do we know that that one just isn't a crappy employee? Mm-hmm. They're an excellent leader They're... of the rest. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And, and so one, I should say, um, I think uh, a great forced question. assignment, um, forced, a forced distribution of, certain amount of people must get a one um, is unbelievably toxic um, in organizations. <laughs> I, I, and, quick, quick story. I yeah. worked at IBM after they acquired Conexa and mm-hmm. that was the one thing we needed to do. Yeah. Okay. There was, there was always certain, certain number of five force number of ones. Who's your, who's your average, con, you know, your, your mainstay contributor. It, it was awful. It's so and unfair. Yeah. Yeah. Throw, when I, throw a dart. I, That's what we did. When I was, I was the Dean of Students at Cornell University and um, in a previous life, and there were still organic chemistry professors um, doing a hard curve, meaning, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, only 10% of the class can get an A. Right. But right. when you're at an Ivy League university, this means that a 94 on the That's exam right. was getting students a C minus. And so in <sighs> trying to meet with the chair of the chemistry department and, and um, the reality, and this is some people might find this interesting, but like... Um, the reality is that that system actually has an asymmetric negative impact. 100%. On first generation college students, working yeah. class college students, adult veteran learners, students Everybody. with disability. I mean, really, it rewards. I don't even know who it rewards. It's not a good evaluation of whether you know or not. horrible. Right? Yeah. It's, it, it is like some, I don't know, like the Spartans having to kill their puppies. Like, it's just a yeah. model of life. I don't understand <laughs> what this is supposed to do, right? Um, and. So, I, yeah, but in going to try and change these systems, people are so wedded to like, this is how you sort the wheat from the chaff. And I'm like, I, I don't, I don't know. It, it seems extremely yeah. toxic and demoralizing. So, yeah, and, just want and, to name. And, and random. And, and so, random, especially because, Ryan, to yeah. your point, sometimes somebody can be underperforming, not because they have no talent. 
but that their talent is misaligned against their current scope. Right. And, and so I think that really savvy organizations right now, and there's many that are doing this, are right. actually putting a premium on internal talent identification and talent mobility because they realize that there's an extraordinary inefficiency in their go-to-market for talent right. acquisition. It's right. both inefficient in, in the normal churn cost of Rex and posting and maintaining your TA division, but also, I, I used to use this phrase, and this is, uh, this is a little rough around the edges, but I, I've watched some of your episodes. I know that you, you keep it <laughs> candid, but like, like we would always say back in the day in one organization I was in, um, if you were trying to make an, uh, a hire and you'd post it externally and you had internal applicants, we'd be like, well, so are we going with the crazy we know? Or the crazy we don't know. <laughs> because like everybody yeah. has made a hire on an external applicant where you were like, this was the best interview funnel ever. Their work sample simulation was crushing. And then they come in and they're just bananas. And you're like, why yeah. did this? And like the person that's been with you for several years, you know certain things about them. You Sorry. know if they're stable, if they're kind, if they if you can count on them to deliver work product when they said they would, if their mm -hmm. say to do ratio is high, stuff that you just don't know when you're interviewing an external. So organizations, especially in um, really tight talent marketplaces are realizing that they've got to get a lot better on internal talent analytics. Now, how we do this is a complete quagmire, right? Like uh, whether we go the skills model, the competencies model, how we can use generative AI to better map um, existing talent against um, um, non-linear career pathing. I think there's a lot of work to do in this space. Right. I'm not a subject matter expert in this. I can have an interesting conversation, but you, you have people in your, in your circles who literally this is all they do. I would say, Ryan, um, to go back to your root question, which was, you know, um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to take it back to this question of like, what do you do with, Oh, uh, is, is a person who's a one, you know, like on the team, yeah. could they be a good team leader? You know, Part of, uh, and then William, you jumped in and you said, how can companies actually create a better model, right? For understanding leadership capacity, as opposed to performance or productivity metrics that have nothing right. to do with leadership. And so um, I work, uh, I do, I, I work with a, a pretty large tech company, 20,000 employees that actually has a framework of leadership where they have codified that a leader needs to be able to show up as a coach a mentor, a public speaker, an uh, inclusion advocate. So they actually have incarnations of leadership that are oh, wow. definable and have skill sets associated with them. They right. really have nothing to do with your IC job. So like right. the public speaking, I mean, this is such an interesting thing that they actually have like a premium placed on a leader's ability to speak to groups. Communicate, to, yeah. To communicate, mm -hmm. right? Tell the and, story, communicate. When you um, go into their hypo program for aspiring and future leaders, they actually, their whole curriculum is based off of these five incarnations of leadership. And for, they're so, I love their approach to speaking. They actually have a group of improv actors that train people in extemporaneous speaking, yep. do the workshop and the, and the role playing to build the skill set around. Um, especially for leaders that don't love this part of their job, but you right. have to be able to pull mm -hmm. your team together after a really bad company all hands where the team is upset and you got to be able to facilitate some kind of a conversation <laughs> and, and how do you do that? Right. And, and so it's there, I do think first and foremost to distill that into something that is tactical or, and practical is have a model, have a model of leadership that is competency based to use very old words. That, are, that is contextual to your company. So a sales leader in a SaaS company um, that is already in a mature stage of its business development may look and feel very different than a sales leader in a consumer goods company that is in a zero to one build. You know, so again, that leadership model has to be so purpose built for your business and its stage on the maturity curve. That would be my guidance there. So uh, last question for me is, You've done you've done some wonderful work on anti fragility and talking about that resiliency and talking about that. Do you do you find companies talking about ambiguity or people that can consume ambiguity? And if so, what's the what's the take or what what do you have on that? Yeah, yeah. So um, the uh, this this is great. I love that you you came here. It's such great counter signal for me 
because the preface, the title of the preface of my book is Disruption Fatigue is Real. <laughs> <laughs> so like, and I know you two didn't read my book. <laughs> <laughs> sure, not yet. I, I read it twice. Dude. I yeah, mean, right, come right. on. Um, but, but Give an so, audio but, version. <laughs> great, great, great counter signal though, right? That, that I think that the trail of gingerbread crumbs is, is very clear, here, right? So um, I open with a, with a preface on um, the human relationship to disruption and ambiguity, because this is actually the root cause analysis for me as right. a behavioral scientist that, that looks at the relationship between humans and their environment and performance. First and foremost is what does it mean to work in a slow motion earthquake? The last five years has been one tectonic disruption after another to the point where our nervous systems are in a constant state of cognitive hijacking, right? If you're familiar right. with fight flight response, mm -hmm. limbic yep. hijacking, oh, cortisol yeah. dump, you know, uh, overall dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin levels start to drop, right? This is, you can see this in meta studies of, of the workforce globally now, lower levels of engagement, lower levels of satisfaction, um, languishing. Is, is the psychological term for where a certain portion of the workforce is. My um, diagnosis here is actually that we are, we are at a state where the battery light is just blinking. We have been disrupted to the point where, um, where the playbook has to include a form of reattachment to work, our team, our boss, our company, our organization, because um, amb humans are actually terrible with ambiguity. Um, Ambiguity uh, first hits our our um, dashboard, our like precognitive dashboard, as a threat. Yeah, and of course, I've I've been I was at a dinner with an engineering leader of a major firm who a couple of months ago said to me, "You're talking about VUCA, you know, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, yep. ambiguity, and yep. all of this behavioral science about how we have to help our workforce navigate this." And he goes, "If change is the only constant, I'm tired of babying folks. Like, just get over it." And I'm like, okay, but, so you, you're not actually getting the point here. Change is the only constant, and we're hardwired to experience it as a threat. That's right. So you can say get over it, and you must personally be pretty buffered from the change. So when everybody else is going, right. I don't know how I'm going to feed my family, or is my job going to be around, or is this technology going to replace my work, or... Uh, or whatever they're worried about. Is my new leader toxic? Or, you know, there's all these things. That's where we, where the what's in it for me shows up strongly. You had a leader on um, uh, your show recently who talked about change management, right? And you had a great mm -hmm. conversation about getting back to like first principles. When people are experiencing volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity as through a fight flight response. And if you're going to be like, change is the only constant, you'll be able to get over it. It's like, you're... <laughs> Uh, well, mm. then, you know, garbage in, <laughs> garbage in, garbage yeah. out, to use a very old Silicon Valley adage, right? Your, yeah, your, yeah. Model, your model for change management is off. You're, you're not recognizing um, the, the core software that homo sapiens have, and, and, and you're going to miss out on the chance to actually retain and advance um, top talent, uh, innovation, and high-performing teams. All right. We'd be remiss if we didn't talk about how to get your book, because today is a soft launch. Yes. So, uh, where's what's the bit? Where 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 do people need to go? Because listening to you, I can just imagine the audience is going to go, uh, "Yeah, I want to know more about that guy." I so, would I would love it and be so grateful and honored if people would pick up a copy of the book. Um, there's two ways to do that right now. So it's Wednesday, September 11th, uh, while we make this recording. If you if you are a fan, you can go to Amazon and hit pre-order, and this is so critical to the way that the publishing industry works, author analytics, lists, algorithms, all of that stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, but there's some delayed gratification in this approach. So you have to be the kid that doesn't eat the marshmallow. Now, <laughs> as the kid that always ate the marshmallow, I yeah, also yeah. know that that's not going to work for everybody. So you can also just, if you put my name, Vijay Pendercore, into Google, you can, my website's the first hit. You, and there is a book page that has a link to buying it directly from the publisher. So the book is called The Alchemy of Talent, Leading Teams to Peak Performance. The publisher is Amplify Publishing Group. You can go to Amplify Publishing right now, hit buy, and the book ships to you. Because some people want to eat that marshmallow now. You want that sweet, fluffy right. goodness, right? And, 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 I, and I totally understand that. But if you're a super fan, you do both. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, one of the questions pre-show I asked you, I said, do they have to, uh, with the publisher in particular, do they have to order in bulk? And mm-hmm. you're like, no, they want one book. They get one book. And another thing that came up in pre-show that I really loved is you wrote it in a way that people can consume it in a flight. So, you know, yes. from, let's say, right. Austin to San Francisco, it's about three and a half hour flight. Yep. You can consume it in that flight. Yes. And, and yes. so... It's Check it not... out. Product demo. We're going to product demo this. I've ah. got a thin head, right? We talked about me being skinny before. So the book is even skinnier than my skinny head. <laughs> um, That's fantastic. Soft cover, easy to put in the messenger bag. And, and there's it's, it's intentionally designed so that right. it's read it on the plane, you're done. And then it sits on your desk because it is actually an action-based practical skills book right. for, for team leaders. Drops Mike, walks off stage. VJ. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Love the book. Ryan and I will promise to read it at some point. (laughs) 